Thank you, Jackie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Nice to see you. I'm Bob Valentine, and it's my pleasure to be here with my uh, old friend, Dr. Bob McGahey, this morning to talk about communication. Everybody who goes through a course of study at university or a junior college or even a high school these days gets a dose of what is called communication, whether it's an English class or a speech class or a study in communication. And after a while, we actually start to believe that we know something about communication. Isn't that deceptive? Because after 20 years of studying communication, I started when I was 12. Yeah, that's about right. And after Dr. McGahee's 75 years of professional work as a PhD, you can tell from looking, can't you? The one thing we've figured out is Hardly anybody knows much of anything about communication. We all say we do, we think we do, we say communication is very important. We say the marriage did not succeed because, well, they just didn't communicate. Or something goes horribly wrong in an organization and we say what we had here was a failure of communication. And the reason that happens so often, we think, is because Communication, though we do it all the time, and everybody knows how to do it, has certain basic rules that are so easy to forget. It's so easy to talk, now it's so, it's so easy to write, so easy to make a phone call, to send an email, that we think communication in and of itself is easy. Well, it's simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. Our mission today is to talk about some things that we often forget but that we never should. Most of the time when we make little mistakes in communication, it's kind of funny. And it's all right to laugh at it. If we can't laugh at ourselves, then we have to laugh at, at Dr. McGahee and me. And that's all right too. Okay. Just so you can keep score, uh, I'm the one in the tan suit with all the hair. Yeah. Okay, so it's a, there's a glare. And whenever there's a glare, you know it's me. Uh, so I'm the one who is formerly Harry, and Doc McGay, he is the one who is <laughs> formerly thin. We don't want you to worry about that. We know nutrition is a very important topic in today's world. Uh, Doc's been, he got a little overweight last year. And, uh, last but he's, year. yeah. <laughs> well, the last year that he was thin, he got a little overweight. And, but he's been knocking it off. He, he got a new diet, and he was telling me the most important thing about a diet is it has to be something that you can do, something you can stick with, something that's possible. And he said, I got it. It was in the Reader's Digest, the two-week diet. Yep. Easy to understand. You just go right through, and, and this is something. He said, this is something I can do, the two-week diet. So I'm, I'm proud of you. How, how's that going? I finished it. <laughs> you already finished it? Yeah. How'd you do? I lost 14 days. <laughs> I could do that one. Well, if you want to know something about communication, let's start here. Bob McGay, he is the distinguished professor. He's been named the outstanding teacher. He's the Frank Stanton Fellow of the International Radio TV Society, an award that usually designates the outstanding college educator in broadcast, in the field of broadcast communication. So nobody understands the basics better than him. Tell us about the basics. Okay, everybody pull out the little packet. You found that packet. And I want to talk about it very quickly because it will scare you, scare you to death when you see it. My former student, uh, Michelle, who booked us in for this, said 9 to 11. You got two hours worth of material. So we're going to have to talk pretty fast now to get through all this. So if you listen carefully, we'll run through it. No, I think what we'll do is we'll hit the highlights. You have the handouts there. It should be the pertinent handouts, okay? Okay, the first one, we're going to talk about basic communications. Nothing's changed since days of old. There's still four basic parts. Sender, receiver, message, channel, right? They're all the speech people, all of me, they say, well, you may have other parts, but you've got to have those four. And they've got to work together, but there's two possible ch chances that the message won't get done right. One of them is called physical noise. Now, this is a good place. Can everybody hear okay? But how many times have you been in a situation, and right now cell phones are a big problem, where somebody's 
talking to you and all of a sudden the cell phone's on, even if they don't pick it up, there's a noise there. There can be a physical noise that keeps people from getting the message, all right? We had a situation back up, Murray's my Murray people, right around here. Anybody else Murray? Dr. Richard? Boy, there's a bunch of you. I better watch what I tell. Richard Blaylock. Everybody know Richard? Was my role model and son of a gun lost 90 pounds and I can't use him anymore. Uh, Richard had a gentleman that had come in that was in his mid 80s and he had some problems. Was, did you get him? No, I'm not. I wanted you to get them. Because flies fall. Well, anyhow. He had some problems with listening and with his eyesight. He was diabetic. But the big problem was, like several of uh, elder people, and I have to be in that one because I have to make myself do he wouldn't drink any liquids. He was almost dehydrated sitting there. They made him sit down and drink two glasses of water right there. And Richard told him, he said, you're going to drink liquids and water or your kidneys will fail, you'll die. Or at the very best, you'll be on this machine. So let me show you this machine, dialysis machine over here. He says, you want to be on that three hours a day, every other day? I said, no. He said, well, you go home and you drink six to eight glasses of water every day, come back in two weeks. The old boy came back in two weeks and he said, you drinking the water? He says, I'm trying, doc. I can't do it. I've really, really tried. And he said, well, I told you. He said, no, I don't want to die and I don't want to be on that machine, but nobody can do that. He said, well, people do it all the time. He said, well, I'd like to meet one of them. He said, I got up to 28 one day, but nobody can drink 68. <laughs> what we have here is a failure to communicate. Okay, physical noise. Any physical noise, which on print can be a typo, that's a physical noise. It keeps the message from going through. And that's the reason when in writing out forms for all the healthcare services, we better make sure everything is correct, the right words, it's documented correctly because it can cause a major problem. Okay, everybody got that? Then the other one's called semantic, semantic noise. Semantic means words have different meanings and the English language is one of the worst, one of the worst. Uh, my Murray people, you remember the surgeon? He's retired now, Dr. Hal Houston. Oh yeah. One of my favorite people. Well, Doc Hal reported he had a guy had done a bypass surgery, an older gentleman from Buckhannon, Tennessee. It's not Buchanan, it's Buckhannon, Tennessee. He lives there now, pretty close to it. And uh, the old boy, he was going through a list of exercises. He said, you still walk? He said, no, no, don't do much walking. He said, well, you got a treadmill. So we hanging clothes on it. <laughs> and he said, well, you still mow your yard? He said, we got to ride more, doc. You play golf? He said, we ride. And he went down through his list of activities to see if he was getting any exercise. And at the end, he says, do you have intercourse? And the old boy said, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You have to know whether you have intercourse. And so he, before they could stop him, he got off the table, went out in the waiting room, hollered over to his wife, Mom, we have intercourse? She said, I've told you and told you. Medicare B, Blue Cross, and that's it. Because <laughs> what we have here is a failure to communicate. That word didn't mean anything to him. It should have. It didn't. There's a next one down there, Joseph Clapper. Here's another problem. If we send the message and there's no problem with noise, either type, each one of us has defense mechanisms. Clapper said we have selective attention, selective perception, selective retention. We will attend to those things which we like and dislike, and in between, we just don't pay attention to them, whether we're reading, watching, or listening, right? And then when we receive it, uh, we'll distort it to make it, you know, believe, fit what we believed. Let me see where I am here. Uh, Western Rivers Corporation. Where are you located, sir? Oh, that's, a, that's the poorest part of town, isn't it? Isn't that it? Now, he knows that, but to make a point. What did I say? It said where? Poorest part of town. He said, fat man don't know, good part of town. Because that's how he recorded it. He distorted it to make it fit what he believed. And when you get into things like religion and politics, we will distort to make it fit. If I get a dire Democrat and I say I'm Republican, well, he say he's a dummy right away. Translate that. Then the last one, which is really tough, selective retention. We will retain, remember, those things which we like and dislike. Think about that. I had a grandmother who lived in Hopkinsville, died in 104. And she finally had to go to the, to the assisted living. She didn't go to the rest of them, assisted living when she was 96. 
she had busted a hip and then was coming back. And uh, she was still up and going. And anyhow, I'd say, Gran, how you doing? Go by and see her coming from Murray, going to Hoptown. And she'd say, how are things at the normal? Murray State started out normal. We haven't been normal lately. And I'd say something, and she didn't mean anything. She was making a conversation. I go back the next day and take her something before I go back to Murray, and she says, how things at the normal? Well, I didn't know what to tell her, but I just finally made up something. But I could say, Grant, you remember that snow of 1919? Oh, that was the worst snow of ever. I remember at 6.15, we woke up, we could hear the cows, and it sounded like dragnet, and it's 17, and it's 18, and because that was selective retention. That was an experience. And we will retain that which we like, something good or something we dislike. All of us, something when we were a kid that was bad to us, might have fallen off a tricycle or dog bit or something like that, that we will always remember. That's the way it works. So remember you have that. Now, the next one, stimulus response reinforcement, when we all want to get words grown. If we ask somebody to do something, we want them to respond a certain way, we must reinforce. How many times would you, somebody ask you to do something and you never hear a word back, whether it was good or bad, or so thank you or any of that? If we're gonna be good communicators, we wanna reinforce. Thank you for doing that, that was a good job. Next time you ask them, they're probably gonna do it. Uh, if you don't reinforce, then they may say, well, heck with you, they didn't say anything last time, I'm not gonna play. So remember, stimulus response reinforcement. Fessinger says, we have a thing called cognitive dissonance. It happens, we have two responses or two stimuli and we can't do them. I used to use an example in the classroom. A uh, little girl, freshman there, boy, ask her out. Well, she's got a test the next day. Does she stay home and study or does she go out? And there's no answer, but it probably is based upon what happened last time. In high school, if you had that situation, you went out and flunked the test, you gonna study. Or if you did okay on the test and the guy was a good guy and you had a good time, you are going out. But there's dissonance and we resolve it based upon what we think will cause us the greater amount of pleasure and the least amount of pain. So you have to understand people have to make decisions like that all the time. Ask Obama. That last one doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. How do we get through to people? In many of the cases that I've just named, repetition. You never see a ad, do you? It's always a bunch of ads in an ad campaign. So if we want to respond to people, we talk to you, we give you a handout, uh, we ask questions to make sure that we got the message through. And so we, as in the medical field, when we talk to people, you must do that. Uh, whatever's the best way to communicate, but don't use just one. If it takes a, little, a PowerPoint demonstration to show things that people don't read very well, then that's what you gotta do, backed up by, of course, oral presentation. <sighs> I just covered three weeks of the first class in journalism. Are you with me? Okay, I need your help though. When I say go, clap once, go. I say go, clap three times. I didn't say go. Go. All right, this is a toughie. When I say go, clap seven times. Go. Thank you for your applause, I appreciate it. <laughs>
he was a Scottish immigrant, you know, so he talked a little bit differently than you and I do. And he, he looked at me and he said, do you people do that? That's how he referred to his four sons and everybody else who was under 50. You people. He said, do you people do that? So yeah, Dad, that's called a twist. It's great. Because all you have to do is stand there and do this. You know, like you're trying to shake something off your backside. You know? Don't hurt anything there. I, I think I pulled a muscle. Because that's all you have to do. And it's great for somebody like me that doesn't have the patience or discipline to take dancing lessons and has no talent whatsoever. You just, and you fit right in with all the other people who don't have talent. Now, there's some people who know how to dance and they make themselves conspicuous by doing that. But yeah, the twist is a great thing. He said, D don't you want to touch the girl? <laughs> so yeah, that's why you go to the dance in the first place, Pop. You know, you dance and then you hope things develop. He said, we used to grab them right there and walk around on the floor holding them as tight as we could. We call it the waltz, the foxtrot, things like that. I said, huh? I said, that's why they call you the baby boomers and they call us the greatest generation. Said, well, you know, we had a point. I don't know, uh, I don't know how there's gonna be another generation because the dancing they do now looks more like calisthenics than dancing and men can't do it. Their knees are already shot from playing baseball and football and they just stand around in a corner and watch the women do calisthenics. Oh, you wouldn't believe it if you went to a college dance now. It doesn't look like anything you would have anticipated. It's kind of frightening. So there's a generation gap, I know that. But we're talking about the gender gap. And there's a reason we have to talk about it. We've got a few gentlemen here, very few. Let me ask, how many husbands here are married? <laughs> yeah, me too. What? What? You, you know, most of the time we'll ask that and men look around, can I raise my hand, is that okay? <laughs> Husbands and wives represent two sides of the gender gap, but really if you stop and think about it, more and more we're finding women who are moving into the boardroom and into the upper reaches of organizational management. Men and women find themselves doing work together on an equal footing, and it's very important that they understand that men and women do not use talking in the same way. If we forget that, we're in trouble. And there is no one way to use talking. There are two ways, the man way and the woman way. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's genetic or if that's the way we're raised. I don't know. I just know there's a difference, don't you? Now, I'm not talking about what the comedians used to do on the Ed Sullivan show in the 1950s. Never saw it myself, but I've heard stories. And they'd say, oh, my wife, she talks all the time. She won't put what? You keep lying like that. We're in a church. The lightning can hit you. Ah, God wouldn't hit this place. There's too many good people in it. I'm insulated. Yeah. I'm not lying. Oh, you mean about me seeing Ed Sullivan? Nah, I saw a taping once. Right here. On the Nostalgia Channel. Yeah, and, and the comedians would say, my wife, she talks all the time. She wore the numbers off the telephone. I tell you, yada, 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 yada. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that men and women do use talking differently. Dr. Deborah Tannen of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. has written a very popular book called You Just Don't Understand Me, Conversations Between Men and Women. She did scientific research, and this is what she found out. Men and women use talking differently. They do. Men, she said, use talking to establish priorities and accomplish tasks. Women use talking to intensify human relationships and deepen interpersonal understanding. Those are two different things. See, for women, the purpose of talking is to do something that's important and rewarding. For men, it has to do with work. Let me give you an example. Suppose everybody in here was a woman, okay? And it, it's almost true. Everybody, everybody. And somebody came in that door, the same door that you came in, they said, I'm sorry I'm late for the meeting. I was in an automobile accident, that's why I'm late. <laughs> Is it not true that in a room full of women you would hear things like, we all right, I bet it was scary. Do you want to sit down? Can I get you a glass of water? Is there anybody you need to call? Have you been to a doctor? I bet it was scary. Do you want to tell us about it? Did I miss anything? No. no. Now suppose it's a room filled with men, just men. Somebody does the same thing. They come in the same door and they say, I'm sorry I'm late. It was an automobile accident. That's why I'm late. 
in a room full of men, is it not true you tend to hear things like, well, you look okay, what about your truck? You tear it up? <clears throat> and if you had enough time and enough men, eventually somebody would say, you were in a wreck. <laughs> I, was, I rolled one out on 68 the other day about 14 times. Kind of got a scratch on my head. And if you have enough time and enough men, eventually or something, wreck. I was killed in a wreck three weeks ago. <laughs> I had to drive my own self over the mortuary. Because men use talking for different purposes than women. It's just true, I know. I had an opportunity. Women can ask men questions that men cannot understand. And it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that women are the next step in the evolutionary ladder. And men are back there tied with the lowland gorilla. It doesn't have anything to do with that. I think we all can agree that women are, as a general rule, far more intelligent than men will ever be. But, as Jeff Foxworthy says, don't be too proud of yourself. You're smarter than a creature whose principal accomplishment of the day is to flip his underwear up in his toe and catch him. Hey, you got him. <laughs> but it's true, women can ask men a question. I noticed this first time uh, when I got married, again, yeah. Well, everybody ought to have a practice marriage, get all those misunderstandings out of the way. Uh, but this time I knew it was coming, and so I was ready for it, and here it came. I got a question I couldn't answer. It's not because I didn't know the answer, it's because I couldn't frame the answer from the masculine point of view. This is what it was. I was meandering through the house one day. Doing what? What? I was meandering. Yeah, I just meandered. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't carrying anything. I wasn't doing any work. I was just kind of walking through the house. Men do that. The male of all species do that, ladies, you know that. Just walk, wandering through the house. Give thanks. If he's dog, he'd be marking his territory as he went. So you're a lot better off. So I was me and I meandered by the bedroom and I got the question to which I could not frame an answer. Here it was. Um, whose underwear is this on the bed? Why are you letting it? Have you asked that question, haven't you? Yeah, I get that from a lot of women, yeah. Whose underwear is this on the bed? So I'm looking at the underwear and I think, well, shoot, I know the answer to that right off. That's good, that's easy. And then I thought, but she doesn't. She asked the question. This is embarrassing for her. I'll try to cover up this obvious lapse in underwear identification ability with a clever answer. So I said, oh, gee, whose underwear? Uh, that, that is a stumper, honey. Um, I got to say, I'm just as baffled as you are, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that unless we've started taking in borders, or you start wearing Hanes 36s with the raggedy edges, I'm gonna say they could be mine. How about that? Does that work for you? It's astonishing how few women find the humor in this very clever response. Yeah. And, and of course, that wasn't what she wanted to know, was it? The men are sitting there, well then why'd she ask? Well, that's what I thought, but women are saying, no, she didn't wanna know that. If she'd been a man, she said, come in here, skinhead. See that? See the underwear? Yeah. Watch me. See? This is a drawer. It's got a little handle on it. Watch this. Open. Closed. Isn't that great? Watch again. Open. Closed. Here comes the hard part. Pay close attention. Open. Put in underwear. Closed. You think you can do that by yourself? Of course, that's harsh, isn't it? And that's why women don't do that, because they're at a higher level of evolution. A woman says, Whose underwear is this on the bed? And she's hoping that a man will say in response, oh dear, that's, that's mine. And you have so thoughtfully folded it and organized it in one pile. Here, let me put it in the drawer right now before, before I forget, because that's where it belongs, in the drawer. Thank you so much, dear, how sweet you are. Let's go out to dinner tonight to celebrate. Of course, that ain't gonna happen. It's more likely the man will say, yeah, that's mine, what about it? Gotta be mine, they're 36s. I wear 34s. 
Actually, I'm a 32. But 34 is feels so good, I buy a 36. Yeah, that's mine. And a woman will say, why can't you put them in the drawers? There's only about half a dozen of them. I'll wear them up by Sunday. <laughs> They're sitting right on the bed. If I sleep all scrunched up, I won't knock them off. What if we have visitors in the bedroom? Is there something you're not telling me? Well, still, you just can't leave them there. Tell you what, Queen of England comes to visit. You stall her at the door with a nice cup of tea. I heard they like that. I'll come in here and shove them under the bed. She won't know a thing. Men and women use talking differently, and we have to remember that. Men uh, don't understand the multiple word deal. Where did that come from? I remember once I said I came in and, and everything in the kitchen was covered up with food. There was groceries and produce and everything. And I went in the living room and I said, hey, I see you've been shopping. No, I haven't. You haven't been shopping? No. Well, then somebody broke in and left food all over the kitchen. There's all kinds of Kroger bags in there. So, oh, well, I went to the grocery store, yeah. Isn't that shopping? Not shopping, shopping. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, men don't understand saying the word twice and changing its meaning completely. They do not understand that. Shopping is shopping, but not to women. Not shopping, shopping. I said, well, did you spend money, money? Because there's food, food in the kitchen, kitchen. <laughs> and they never will understand it. I asked my niece, she said, uh, I said, do you like that boy you're going out with? I said, yeah. So you like him? Well, I don't like him like him. <laughs> but she's really taken with the uh, older of the two football quarterback playing brothers. What's her name? Good boy that played for Tennessee. Oh, you're talking about the Manning boys? Yes. Oh, yeah. The elder Mr. Manning. Uh, really taken with him. I said, you like that guy? I said, I totally, totally love him. <laughs> I said, well, Okay, but if you totally, totally love him, what's left for the guy that you will eventually marry if it's not him? What do you say? You're gonna get married to this guy? Yes, well, you can't totally, totally love him because you burned that up on Peyton Manning. What, what would she say in the vows? I find you reasonably adequate. I don't know why we can't do that, but I've noticed more. Haven't you noticed that? People saying the word twice and trying to change the meaning? You got here fast, yeah, well, not fast, fast. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But women do, don't they? Yeah, that's what I mean. Women use language for talking one way and men use it for talking in another, and we may not understand that. You know, if you go to a husband purgatory, you see all those, have you ever been to, I know you have, you've been at least by husband purgatory. The men know where it is, don't you? Where is it? Yeah, it's at the mall. <laughs> well, what's purgatory? Uh, I don't know, you, you may be Presbyterian and not sure, but you ask somebody who knows, and they'll tell you it's a place you go, it's not necessarily good, it's not necessarily bad, but you ain't getting out, and you're there because you committed a sin of some kind. You may not know what it is, but there you are, and there you stay until somebody bails you out. And that's where husband purgatory is, in the mall. It's, it's, it's a little place you go to, and they usually have a fake brick wall surrounding fake dirt with fake plants in it. You said that's the last place you can smoke, usually. And, and you're just there. Uh, you go at Christmas, last Christmas, we came up to Paducah and went to the husband purgatory. And, and my wife asked me the, the screwiest question a man will ever hear. She said, okay, now I think I can be done with my shopping in an hour and a half. Can you be finished by then? <laughs> I said, I don't know, they got a hardware store? No, it's the mall. Think they have an automobile park? No, it's the mall, it's just the mall. Yeah, I think I can work it in 90 minutes. What, is, what do you do if you're maybe just walk up and down? I mean, you can go by the Victoria's Secret place, but after 15 minutes they call security and he runs you off. <laughs> So you go down to husband purgatory and you sit there and you, uh, I sat down next to a guy, had a cigarette, he was smoking away. He said, how you doing? I said, good. You want to smoke? I said, no, I quit back in 92. He said, yeah, me too. <laughs> I said, your 
wife here shopping? He said, God, I hope so. <laughs> How long have you been here? Uh, since Wednesday. <laughs> now we sat there for about a half an hour without saying anything. Men do that. And I noticed a cockroach crawled out from under the plastic brick wall. I said, hey, look, they got livestock here. <laughs> the fellow looked down and said, oh. So I hate a cockroach. Said, well, you're not my favorite pet either. And we sat there for another 30, 45 minutes. Finally, Vicky came along with a bunch of bags, said, oh, I hope I'm not late. I said, no, you're right on time. I just sit down, relatively speaking. Okay, carry this, carry this, here we go. So we're leaving, and I said, well, take care of yourself, buddy. He said, yeah, watch your back. <laughs> so I headed off. She said, did you know that man? I said, no, no, not really. How long have you been there? Well, better part of a half hour, that's for sure. What's his name? I don't know. Where is he from? I don't know. What's he do for a living? I don't know. <laughs> you were there for half an hour talking to him? You don't know anything? Yeah, sure I do. Well, what? He hates cockroaches, I know that. <laughs> now, if that had been a woman sitting there, she would know where he was from, where he was born, his uh, dearest childhood memory, how many children in the family, if he has a family, everything. I'm not making fun. Here's, have I said anything that's not true? I'll give you a rebuttal right now. That's 1950s stuff you did. Huh? Well, okay, so maybe I was born in the early part of the 1950s. Look, this is why it's important. When women and men find themselves doing important jobs that require communication, we can't say, let's stop being who and what we are. Let's be communication machines, because we are who and what we are. But we can try to remember that men and women use talking differently. And women may have to be patient until he starts to talk, right? And men may have to be patient until she stops. <laughs> That's okay, we have to remember who and what we are. Look, what did Dr. Tannen say? Women use talking to deepen interpersonal understanding and intensify human relationships. Men use talking to establish priorities and to accomplish tasks. What's the definition of a good organization? people who get the job done with consideration, understanding, and concern for the people with whom they work. If we can put the strengths of women talking together with the strengths of the way men talk, we have the operational definition of a successful organization. But only if we are aware of each other's strengths and weaknesses and we are considerate of them. You're not gonna turn a woman into a man by making her use shorter sentences and you're not gonna turn a man into a woman by making him open up. No man, when you say, how was your day? No man is gonna say, well, at 7.30 this morning, I jumped out of bed, I said, my gosh, at 7.30, I have a lot to do, so I, and then the hair dryer wouldn't work, oh, heavens to Betsy, and so then I couldn't find the keys to my car. You know how I'm always losing the keys to my car? Well, they were down in the bottom of my pocket. Men are not gonna do that, and women are not gonna do what they don't do. But we can all be aware, considerate, and patient. Then we're gonna get the job of communication done, no matter how you use talk. That's gotta be good news for everybody, men and women. Generations. They won't hit one color. I didn't say go. See, I didn't have to say go. They wanted you to go. That's right. If we clap, he'll leave. Let me hit one up there. We're trying to run very quickly here. In the uh, difference of colors, you know men don't know the name of the colors because nothing comes in the basics anymore. You <laughs> ladies know that, right? Uh, Bob said that he was getting ready to go out one night. And he asked his wife, says, can I wear my sword or gray pants with this shirt? She says, you don't have any sword or gray pants. I do too. I got light gray, dark gray, and sword of gray. She says, bring them here. Let me see them. So he brings them down in his mouth like a Labrador Retriever, you know. <clears throat> she says, that's taupe. Taupe. See, the ladies all know that. This man here is looking at me like I never heard of that one. I'm with you, and you're not going to look it up either because it's spelled Taupe. T-A-U-P-E. See, the French and the women did that so we wouldn't know. 
Bob said he called a buddy of his. He said, you know, I got some pants in their tope. He said, take them to the cleaners, they'll fix them. <laughs> but he told no, he says, I got some pants in there, sort of gray. So know what you mean, I had a Buick that same color. <laughs> and we could go on and talk about uh, Mauvi and Fuscia. And, and one of my favorites was salmon. What color is salmon? It's pink. See, to me, salmon's a fish. It's gray. It's the way it ought to be. And there's a whole bunch more we could go through. Let's talk a little bit about generation. Bob mentioned a couple of these. Uh, particularly grandmothers here, you really know this. People come up with words you've never heard of before. They make them up. But sometimes it's reversed. I was in church when Bob spoke at the Presbyterian Church last time, and I heard this woman say, that man over there, he's a CEO. And I'm thinking, I've known that guy all my life. He's never been in charge of anything. I said, he's the CEO? He said, yeah, he comes on Christmas and Easter only. <laughs> so there's one they had, they didn't, we didn't understand that terminology. You're gonna remember that one, aren't you? I can tell, yes. And the other thing, the technology today with the computers and all the terms and like that, I tried to wear out my class last semester. I said, you know, I'm getting with it. I got me an IPID and uh, I, I've got your space and my face and, <laughs> and uh, I've got a blueberry. I'm working on learning how to get my blueberry to work. And you think about the words that we didn't know three years ago that all came from the computers and cell phones and everything like that. I got a cell phone. I got one of the early ones. If you want to call me, it's 12. <laughs> it was by Verizon or Horizon or some kind of zone like that. And you think about it, we could go on and on, but you have to watch again to make sure that the words they're using, you understand to be using. I have a great example and I cannot use it. I just can't bring myself to use it. If you want to see me everywhere over, I'll tell it what it is. But it just wore me and Bob out when we were up at Elizabeth College, the residential college. So the generations, make sure. If you're giving uh, health care to elderly people, make sure that the technical terms, the medical terms, you explain them in layman's terms over and over. Repeat, repetition, right? That's a way to solve most of the communications problems. Make sure that there is repetition. Now, how many of you like to go to meetings? How many of you like to play in traffic? Same number, that's what I always figure. Why don't we like to go to meetings? Boring. What? Boring. Boring, good. Anything else? Too long. Too long. Have to sit. What? Have to sit. Have to sit. I had a meeting one time, made them all stand. Good short meeting. <laughs> Thank you, you don't accomplish anything. I could have been working, right? There's a handout in there, you see that one under communications on meetings, isn't that in there, Robert? I hope it is. Here's a few tips. You like that one? Are you lonely? Call a meeting, have you know donuts, have fun, work on it. Uh, first thing it is, we, there are four or five tips in there to make sure. One is start on time, end on time. If you do that, people will come. But if you're late and they sit there and then before long everybody's late and then you're late, start on time, end on time. Uh, Ma'am, do you know who we are? Have you, have you ever seen us before? Many years ago, which I'll speak to him about that later. How many years ago? Uh, years ago. No, come on. No, no, no. <laughs> She said many years ago. Okay, but the deal with, if I came along, he's in the back seat and, I, and I'm driving, would you get in the car and go ride with me? I said, come on, get in, we're gonna take a trip. Why? Why wouldn't you go? <laughs> I guess I told her not to get in. That's right, my mom told With stranger, we've met. He's the fat guy that talked at the meeting. <laughs> why would be the main reason why you wouldn't go, other than you think, I'm too fat to chase, so, you know. <laughs> What's the one real reason why you wouldn't go? You want to ask me something? We, didn't know where we're going. we don't know where we're going. And gang, if you don't have an agenda at a meeting, you don't know where you're going. You don't know. If you've been to a meeting where there's no agenda, we're just going to have our monthly meeting or our Monday meeting. That's death. That's just like taking your life away from you. Have an agenda. I got in trouble because of that rule, because it's my rule. Uh, the dean had a meeting, didn't send the agenda, I didn't go to the meeting. He said, where are you? We're all sitting here. And I said, I didn't think we were meeting. He said, why? And I didn't get an agenda. 
how would I know what to bring and what to be ready for? Well, you get over here. I wasn't chairman the next year, I recall that. <laughs> but I didn't have to go to the meeting. Have an agenda for sure. And the other thing is come early, but stay late if you want. Come early, do the niceties. How you doing? How's your son doing? And talk about things, because we like to talk, but do it early. Don't do it during the meeting and don't delay the meeting. Afterwards, then you can hang around and do that. Others want to go do something else. Those four things, I think, will pretty much take you through the meetings. How many of you spend time on the telephone? We almost have to, don't we? How else are we going to take a picture? <laughs> Tell them about telephones, Bob. You know, uh, years ago, an astronaut took over Eastern Airlines as the CEO. His name was Frank Borman. He was one of, the, uh, one of the original seven Apollo astronauts. And when he retired, they made him president of Eastern Airlines. That's kind of a good fit. And when he signed on, they said, OK, Mr. Borman, you're president of Eastern Airlines. The office is open at 9 o'clock. Uh, we've got an apartment here in New York City for you. Uh, we'll send a car to pick you up. So when do you want him to pick you up? You're only about 20 minutes away, even in rush, rush hour traffic. He said, uh, 6.30. <laughs> 6.30? The staff doesn't even get there till 8 o'clock. He said, oh, yeah, you're right. Make it 6 o'clock. And when they asked him, why does he go in there three hours before Eastern Airlines officially opens for operation, this is what he told them. He said, look, I'm a CEO. If I don't get all my work done between six and nine, it won't get done because from nine on, I'm gonna be interrupted all day long. There's always something that's important. I'm gonna be interrupted all day long. So he went in six, in three hours, he got all his work done. And he also mined the harbor, okay? He laid it out there, he took care of it. Starting about eight o'clock, he knew that everybody else's secretary was gonna be there, so he'd call him. Hi, this is Frank Borman, Eastern Airlines. I need to talk to the CEO of uh, Texaco about jet fuel prices. Is he there? Oh no, he won't be here. When can I talk to him? Well, he has an open schedule at, at 10, from 10 to 10.30. I said, would you pencil me in for the 10 o'clock and ask him to call me back, here's my number. And then he took that and put it in the 10 o'clock slot. So he knew who he was gonna talk to, when he was gonna talk to, about what, all day long. He set up his day using the telephone. Today, social scientists tell us we don't do that. We don't have to set up our day because it's going to be interrupted by the telephone. One of my first professional jobs was as consultant to the president of a small corporation. And when I go in to talk to him in his office, I noticed this would happen. We'd be talking and the telephone would ring. Now he had six people out there, any one of whom could answer the telephone. But he'd say, well, I'll tell you what we want to do, Bob. The next phase of the operator, and the telephone would ring, he'd say, next phase of the operator. And he would look at the telephone until it didn't ring and he knew somebody had it. And then he would sort of wait with a sense of anticipation until somebody came in the door and either brought him a little pink piece of paper that said, call this guy back, or he assumed the call wasn't for him. But his concentration was shattered by the ringing of a telephone and he couldn't go on. So I stopped meeting him there. He said, well, let's have our meeting. I said, okay, let's meet in the conference room. He didn't think anything of it, but the beauty of the conference room is there was no telephone in there. And that's the first time, this was in the 1970s, back when I was in my teens, and it made me realize, if you want to communicate with somebody, remember what Doc said about physical noise, the things that distract us? We might have to get away from the telephones, and in today's world, that has become almost impossible. I've had people who didn't realize that they had their telephone with them until it started playing the overture from William Tell, also known as the Lone Ranger song. I said, what's that noise? I don't know. Oh, I must have my telephone with me. And the guy couldn't find it. He was a big guy. It wasn't Doc. He couldn't find his telephone. And after a while I said, why don't you just stop looking, because when you do find it, I don't think I want to know where it was. <laughs> and I was about to make a suggestion, but that would be rude. <laughs> the telephone interrupts us and we can't get work done. And here's what more and more corporations are doing. They are prohibiting the cell phone in the workstation during work hours. Turn it off, it's gone. 
we had that policy at Murray State University in the theater department when I was doing some master's classes for the theater department. And the department said, no cell phones, you turn them off. And they made this rule, you turn them off. If you forget to turn them off, the instructor or the stage manager, if you're in a production, will confiscate your telephone, put it in a little box, you get it back when you leave. If that happens three times in a play, we keep it until the play is over. Don't you know there are some people who would just die, literally expire? Oh, she was such a nice young girl. What happened to her? They took her cell phone away and she just died. What a shame. She was so young. I kind of think it would happen. And when I told the class this was going to be policy, you turn it off, you don't turn it off, I'll take it away from you. Somebody said, what if it's an emergency? I said, like what? Well, like, like my grandmother died. She died, and they're calling to tell you? Yes. It's, it's only a 50-minute class. I'm pretty sure by the time we get done, she'll still be in that unfortunate condition. And if she comes back, you can take that call. That'll be big news. I said, anybody get an emergency call? Like what? Go ahead, turn it on. Let's see what you get. So we all turned on the phones, and they all went off because they were, had messages waiting. I said, what's your message? Let me see it. Want to know what we were going to wear to the party tonight. Here's another one. Got to make, the time of the intramural football game has been changed from 8.30 to 8.45 tonight. Oh, we had to have that right now. There was nothing in there. Most of it was nothing that had anything to do with anything, let alone something useful. Are you controlling the telephones in your life, or are they interruptions? Are they giving you the ability to reach who you need to reach when you need to reach them? Or do they keep you from accomplishing the mission you need to accomplish? The telephone is a tool. It's like a hammer. We can leave it on the wall when we're not using it. It doesn't have to run our lives. Now you probably know that, and you've got it in control. But sometimes we have to be wary of how other people react to the telephone. It's just a tool. It's not a god, and we shouldn't treat it like one, no matter how young we are. Wouldn't you say that's true, small personage? Oh, let's do this. I'll run a quick memo. We got to do science. Okay. Okay. You'll see in your handout uh, about memos, media, uh, memos, and I guess letters, things like that. And then there's a whole two-page, three-page thing of errors. And this era package came about about 20 years ago, the uh, Associated Press and them. Do you see that? All talk about communication errors, typos, words that are misused. Common errors. Common errors, some of those, yeah. There may be another one. Is there anything attached to that? A long package? Yeah. Yeah, at the end probably. Yeah, there you go, 50 common errors. Uh, yes. We're not going to cover those obviously in the next five minutes. Uh, but do this. People I know that wouldn't make an error in a letter, when they do email, it looks like a ransom note. <laughs> you notice that? No capital letters, no punctuation, all with old period in there sometime. Isn't that amazing? Do they not know we have a printer and we can show that to everybody we know? Did you see this dumb letter? So the main thing I want to tell you, make sure it is accurate, because if not, it becomes a physical noise. If people can't read it, it's so bad, you can't, you know, it doesn't work. So go through there, you can look through there on, on the memos. The other thing is don't send memos and letters to anybody that doesn't need it. You ever get one, you get a thing and it doesn't say CC, and you say, why did I get this? And you spend half a day figuring out if you have to do that or not. Only send it to the people you need. Okay, let's talk about signs. Look around the room. There's some beautiful signs here, aren't they? Easy to read, get your attention, colorful, right? The sign is the oldest way of communicating. It goes all the way back, right? But you know, we don't use signs well sometimes. Sometimes we think it will solve a problem like the food industry did. Can I do testing, testing? How are we doing? Are we testing? I feel like Garth Brooks. I've got this old thing in my ear. Or what's her name? Britney Spears? That, that proves money doesn't matter, doesn't it? Uh, they didn't yeah. know it until they shaved their head, and then there it was. <laughs> the food industry years ago 
said, we have a problem. We can't get people in and out fast enough to make as much money as we need. So here's what we'll do. We'll get a microphone. We'll use technology to solve the communication problem. We get a microphone, we'll put it in a menu, a big plastic menu outside, and people can order and then we'll talk right back at them and that'll solve all the problems. And, and they were right. Or were they? Here's communication that relies on technology to solve the problem. Let's, uh, let's say that Doc represents the average American family. They're in the family car. They're driving up to this talking sign. Good luck. All right, y'all get ready. We ain't going to be here very long, I hope. Oh, I don't know what's going on. take a pick. I don't know. Hey, in there, we'd like to order some food. Oh, that's not right, I mean, I don't want to play the spread. It's probably where I said, well. All right, I'm going to try. Here we go. I'd like to have a dozen cheeseburgers. That's seven with mustard only and seven with everything. <laughs> you don't know how many of my students will never get that joke. <laughs> By the way, Tammy is not paraplegic. Oh, well, there's the end of the arm. I'll tell you about seven minutes, seven minutes only. Would you like to drink with that orc? Drink? Yeah, that's right. right. Drink with that orc? Right. All right, all right, let me have uh, four Coca-Colas, that's two new ones and two old ones, <laughs> and a chocolate milkshake, except you don't call it that. All right, all right, uh, seven, 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 two classic Coca, two regular Coca, one thick truck chocolate shake. With a gold man French right there? French fries? Yeah, uh, so we like gold man French right there? Right. <laughs> all right, let me have three orders in French fries. All uh, right, so what size French fries are Size? Yes, sir. What size on the French fries? Well, they're kind of skinny and they're about this long. <laughs> they're pretty good. All right, so we got seven cheeseburgers, seven minutes only. Classic Coca Cola, two regular Coca, one three, three gold men French fries. Would you like a delicious hot apple pie with that? Hot, hot apple pie? Yes, sir. Would you like a delicious hot apple pie with that? Don't want one. All right, so we got seven cheeseburgers, seven minutes only. Classic Coca Cola, two regular Coca, one three, three gold men French fries, and one delicious hot apple pie. Thank you very much. Pretty pretty on say went. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I ain't driving nowhere. We had a communications problem toward the end. Hot apple pie, no, no, we didn't want that. We didn't, we didn't order that too, no. Uh -uh. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so I had seven cheeseburgers, seven minutes, two classic cultures, two regular cultures, and three red, three gold brand french fries, and two delicious hot apple pies. Thank you very much, sweet drive <laughs> Hey, we're having a communications problem here. We wouldn't want hot apple pie if it was for free. Oh, sorry, sorry. So that's uh, seven cheap minutes, seven minutes, two classic Coca Cola, two regular Coca Cola, and three, uh, three gold French fries, and three delicious hot apple pies. Thank you very much, please, for the same Hey, hey, you watch my lips. <laughs> we tried your hot apple pie when you run a coupon in the paper, and it made my wife sick. Oh, sorry, sir. Okay, here's a real sir. We got seven cheap minutes, seven minutes only, two classic Coca Cola, two regular Coca Cola, one thick butter, three gold men French fries, and six delicious hot apple pies. Thank you very much, please, for the same <laughs> All right, here we go, last time. Want the burgers, want the fries, want the drinks, but hot apple pie, I don't want any. Oh, thank you, sir. 20 delicious hot apple pies. Please drive around the same window. <laughs> okay. I don't know, I hope we didn't miss any of no, that's good. <laughs> okay, two things we want you to remember. You want to do that, I'm, I'm going to need to pull this coke here. Okay, go ahead, you do it. <laughs> I got it at Murray Tent and Canvas. <laughs> they fit anybody. You know, in all the things we've been talking about, the, in, in the last hour, there are at least two things that we hope you remember. First of all, if you want to be an effective communicator, don't forget, first, you've got to listen. And second, first, first there's two things, two. Hey. Well, that's a sign. And I suppose it is, yeah. <laughs> what does that stand for? Peace, victory. See, you see the generations coming now. Victory, peace, and of course a Roman ordering five beers. <laughs> oh, Roman numerals. Remember, you remember, hey, you remember Nixon? Nixon, yeah, yeah. Ten beers. Ten beers. That no, explains no. That's Ten. Everything, everything you needed to know about the 70s Ten. right there. Two go. things. First, you want to be a good communicator? Listen, and second, no matter what the crisis is, how bad a day you're having, never ever lose your sense of humor. 
You've shown you've got a good sense of humor. We've enjoyed being with you. Have a good day.